Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Open Source in Business, a series of conversations that I've been having with uh, experts from various domains in the open source world, um, kind of bringing a broad lens, a wide lens to, to the value that open source brings um, beyond you know, uh, the typical conversation that we have around, uh, around venture-funded uh, startups. Uh, so today, I'm joined by Miguel de Catha who is a very well-known um, free software and open source uh, hacker and uh, currently a distinguished fellow with Microsoft. Um, Miguel, you. I don't want to go into all of your career because there's just too much there, but let's uh, just say you started working on free software uh, in the early 90s whilst while you were still at college. Uh, right. You created uh, the first project I was aware of. Uh, you creating was Midnight Commander. Is that was that your first? That uh, was my first project. Although I had contributed on, I, I had nibbled at different things, and I, I and now the history it's it's kind of all blurred, so I don't remember what came first. But I nibbled <laughs> at a few other things here and there. And uh, after after that, that was like ninety four, I think, uh, was the first Midnight Commander release. Midnight Commander was ninety four, I believe. Yeah. Are you still maintaining that, or has that? No, I don't. I still use it every day, but I don't maintain it. It's, okay. uh, it's uh, the baton has passed many times now. Maintainership has has passed the, the different people now. And then the the story I heard, uh, and you can tell me if this is right, is that you uh, worked on the Spark port of Linux. That's without true. actually having a Spark available at the time. No, no, that that part is not true. Okay, <laughs> I did have I did have plenty of Sparks available. Okay, then perhaps it was. I I know you worked on uh, one of the Linux subsystems as well. Was that RAID maybe? I also worked on RAID, uh, but again, the point of Linux RAID was to bring RAID to traditional devices. Right, you didn't need to have a a, a form a RAID hardware. The idea is you could use off the shelf. Okay. Uh, hardware. So, so you didn't have a, a RAID controller uh, when you did the RAID subsystem. You were just using. Right, the because the code. point was, yeah, the point was to not, yeah, exactly. But the point was to 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 essentially use RAID for regular, uh, for on top of regular files. Uh, okay. Devices. Yeah. So I got my stories mixed up then. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but okay. so I mean, very clearly in the in the early and mid nineties, you were. Uh, a very very prolific uh, free software hacker and a volunteer with the GNU project. That's where I came across you. Was obviously you know you're best known as the founder of the GNOME project, which was right uh, yes. the mid nineties. And I gotta say, I believed in the mission. Right, the mission was I was in love with the objective of having an entirely free operating system, and uh, I was in love with the mission. And there were you know in the early days there was work for everybody to do a lot of things. Uh, it was so exciting to read. There was this forum called Compost Linux Announce, and it was so exciting and so inspiring to read every day, you know, five or seven new things that unlocked the potential of Linux. So uh, there was work for everybody. There, it was a lot of fun. It was very vibrant, moving very quickly. We were all kind of building the future together. Uh, it was fabulous. It was really interesting. So you started a, a company around uh, Gnome in '99, Zimian, uh, which was called Helix Cold originally, right? Well, I went through a number of phases, right? The first name was called uh, we we decided we need a press release, so we typed up something in Emacs uh, that looked like a press release. We've never issued a formal press release, so we make it look like a press release. We printed it out, and I think we handed it out at the. It was a conference in North Carolina. I forget the name, the exact name, but uh, it was one of these Linux conferences in North Carolina. And we distributed to people. We went to Kinkos or whatever the, the the thing was at the time. We printed I don't know fifty or hundred copies, and we went around giving them out. And that first company name was International Gnome Support. Oh wow! It, it later <laughs> morphed. The name later morphed into Helix Code. Um, and then it later morphed into Zimian. And the morphing, the first one was just, it was a terrible name, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, the second morphing took place because Helix was a brand, was a trademark. And uh, while well, the company was called Helix Code, it made it difficult for us to sell Helix Evolution, Helix Gnome, Helix, because we're using it as a prefix. So 
Anyways, uh, we got a cease and desist. We decided not to fight it and, uh, and just proceeded with a very painful renaming of the company. But you did land on the, um, the Simeon theme with the X's, which has stood you in good stead in the meantime. Yes, well, and, and actually, if you take a step back, Helix Code was also inspired by that. So what happened is that at the time, uh, Nat and myself uh, had either read uh, a bunch of stuff around evolution and Darwin and, uh, and uh, natural selection, and there were all these books about, uh, about how it came to be, and they were popularized at the time, The Moral Animal, The Red Queen, you know, very interesting scientific books. Uh, uh, for uh, education, and uh, we liked them. So Helix was in that line of names. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think in the company, the server names were all, uh, you know, themed that way, right? So I think uh, our email server, our email server was mRNA, right? For the messenger RNA. The or code repository, right, where we kept all our files, CVS was called dna.helixcode.com. So we had DNA, mRNA, Galapagos, Darwin, uh, baboons, you know, they're all these things that were uh, around the evolutionary theme, right? Right. That Helix code evolution, right? The product itself, evolution. So there was a history already. So we kind of sticked around the theme. Uh, the monkey was just another one of the themes, but it was all, all based on that. So... The early days of Zimian, right, mm -hmm. and even before Zimian, um, yes. I, I remember stories of you giving a demo of an early version of GNOME at a Linux event, and somebody being connected via um, terminal via an X term and restarting the graphical applications every time they crashed. Was it? Was it? Was it? Is this uh, a numeric or something? Was was one of the applications? I can't remember the exact. I don't remember that one. Was was that before? The... Um, oh, you don't remember that? Um, well, I'm wondering. Was the first demos of uh, GNOME was that before or after the creation of uh, of what became Zimian? Or what, what, you were you were working with I Red Hat? Recall, uh, I don't recall this. Point? I don't recall this particular anecdote, but I do remember that. One time, the, the closest that I can think of is that one time, years later, maybe 2005, uh, so this is years later, Nat and myself did a keynote or a, a, a talk in India, in Bangalore, and we decided to do a fun, the talk was a fun live uh, demo that we would type live, and it was a distributed application where one of us would write the server or the other one would write a client and we were manipulating the remote uh, application uh, directly. And I believe I embedded a web server into a spreadsheet or something like that. And Nat was controlling it remotely, something. Anyways, it was a really fun presentation. I think that that might have been the genesis of this, but it was a live coding thing that we came up a few days before the presentation with. And it was, it was fun. It was really one of the most fun talks we've done. Um, did you at that? So going back to the very early days of GNOME, did, yeah. um, before starting Zimian, I know that Red Hat was one of the first companies to in, to invest in it and through Red yes. Hat Advanced Development Labs and yes. Federico worked for them for a while. Yeah. Did you also work for them? I never worked for them, but uh, but Red Hat was an important founder of GNOME because what happened was that I was working on the Linux kernel stuff. I can't remember what I was working on something on the kernel. And, uh, and I had a good relationship with Eric Krohn at Red Hat because of the port of Linux to the Spark. And they were shipping a Linux Red Hat for Spark. So we had a good re relationship. And one day in one of these announcements, I found KDE, right? In one of these Compos Linux announcements, I saw KDE and I emailed Eric. And I also, I think I emailed Richard. I can't remember the order, but uh, I say, hey, you got to check this out. This is the future. We got to... We, we, we got our chance, let's let's jump on this. And uh, both of them, and I can't remember the order, replied essentially like, yes, it's really nice, but the problem is the license. We cannot distribute this as part of Red Hat because of the QT license, it's prohibited. And Stallman replied something along those lines and my heart sank, right? Because this was beautiful work, well-coordinated, well done. 
but they had we had worked so hard to get everything free and all of a sudden this layer in the middle was proprietary and uh, you know there was an appeal there was a reason there was a valid reason a valid view that hey you know not everything has to be free you know it's more about productivity this helps us move forward faster so but for some of us it was a matter of principle right we can't base the future of the right twist them on a proprietary piece so they both reply very quickly that it couldn't be done and this is what triggered the okay what can we do and we looked into many different options so gnome is the decision we ended up going but we researched many many other options along the way and you know i'll be happy when to talk about yeah that. yeah including uh i remember there was a a, a free software port of cute which was called uh something um harmony yeah but harmony. That, that came after so what happened no but what we looked is for example should we use gnu step right should right. we use uh uh gtk was one of the contenders there was another one which was can we use java and cafe can we use uh uh you know should we just use plain x uh so the, uh, should we use tk which was another toolkit at the time so we did a bunch of explorations and we ended up with gtk because it had a community it had the game going there was a, a pool of contributors that that had some experience. It was free. It, it you know it passed all the checks. Um, and uh, no harmony happened as a reaction to GNOME. You know, essentially, a different group of people felt that hey, listen, we understand your concern, but rather than throwing away the high level layers, let's let's build an alternative. Okay. And, uh, and it was important because the existence of harmony and the existence of GNOME uh, sort of made the Troltec folks essentially change their mind on their license. Yeah. Um, so they were important projects from that perspective, and that's why we have the license today that uh, yeah. Qt has. I think I think Nokia's adoption of Qt as well, um, which came a little bit later, was, was a big contributing factor as well for Troltec, but... Uh, um, um, yeah. Um, um, was, was enlightenment around at the time? I'm sorry. Was enlightenment around at the time? Had that had no, all of that? That, uh, uh, that happened a lot later. Enlightenment is probably a year later in the decision making process. Okay. And in fact, we met with uh, in one of these conferences where we showed GNOME or the early versions of GNOME, maybe in 1999 or 1998. I can't remember. Was uh, there was this conference that Red had run in North Carolina or contributed to? Uh, we met Rasterman, and at the time, Rasterman was not really building a window manager yet. He was styling X application. Turns out that XAW, XAW, which is a very old and primitive toolkit, right. uh, was stylable if you knew how to do it. And it turned out that it was sort of a dark art, and nobody knew about these capabilities. And Rasterman had kind of uh, blossomed in the world of theming this app. So he had a beautiful set of really old and busted X applications that look very modern. And it was very surprising. So I think our first interaction with him was that. It was like, holy shit, this is possible. Um, and uh, and eventually he would do the window manager, but that was kind of a separate thing. And it happened a, a year later. So Red Hat did hire him as part of the Red Hat Labs uh, um uh to do that work okay so i remember um like the two main startups around gnome were yourselves and easel uh that was founded by bart decrum mm -hmm. um, and obviously easel has uh you know kind of gone by the wayside how how difficult was it in those early days uh creating a company around gnome and, and evolution um, well, so first of all did, were, like, financially how did you get through that like 2001 period well, there was actually another French company. I forget the name now, but it was uh, headed by Bertrand Guniev. Uh, he was building, I believe, a calendar application. And he really wanted to focus on mobile, which at the time was unheard of. Bertrand eventually, I don't know what happened to the company, but Bertrand eventually ended up leading iCal for Apple years later. So the calendar app that we know and love on the iPhone and Apple ended up coming from him. Um, it was difficult from a couple of, in a couple of ways. One was that 
we didn't know how to build a company, right? So we built Helix because Nat and I had been good friends on IRC and we knew that we wanted to do something together. And we, we kept asking Red Hat to give us a job, but we said, hey, we don't want to work in North Carolina. We want to work remotely from Paris. And uh, it had became almost a joke that uh, Donnie Barnes from Red Hat kept saying, well, how are you in Paris, Texas, right? Uh, so they wouldn't <laughs> give us a job. And, you know, at one point they kept mocking us for you're never going to do that. So it came, became kind of a dare uh, to Nan and myself to do this. So. We decided to build a company and we didn't know what we're doing. We thought we could just get some uh, consulting contracts going. Um, so we didn't really know what we're doing. We, you know, we read a bunch of books at the time, you know, the information that was available building companies was not as, as wide as it is today, but we read a couple of interesting books in the era. One was the book on the formation of Netscape. That was fun. I can't remember the name anymore. It's from uh, the guy that founded SGI. So there was really interesting read about what goes into this. There was another book called uh, High Stakes, No Prisoners uh, from Charles Ferguson, I believe. And it was a fun book because this guy built the startup, sold the startup to his main competitor, uh, Microsoft. Hated Microsoft with a passion. Um, but I guess he made enough money that he, the book has all kinds of really in-depth descriptions about people that you wouldn't read for fear of you know burning yourself so it's, <laughs> it's very honest and and if you know the people you're like oh oh well, absolutely right so it was a very honest book and i did enjoy reading it um anyways we read what we could this is the year 1999 so is not as, you know, startups are not as easy to build as they are at the time. And Easel, on the other hand, came with a bunch of industry veterans. Uh, I can't remember the name of the CEO boys, I believe. Uh, Andy Hertzfeld, uh, Bartik Krem uh, didn't really have a lot of uh, startup experience, but he had done NGOs, I believe. Uh, but he had joined forces with people that were uh, ex-Apple, X general magic. So they knew what they were doing. And um, anyway, so I think the, the, the main difference between the two companies really is that we were very scared of spending money. So we, we cherished the little money that we had, which was about two and a half million dollars of VC funding. And we were very, very conservative. We did hire remotely. At the time, it was not standard. People, you know, Easel really hired locally the way that it was used to be done. We developed them IRC for the most part. They had the benefit of working from an office. Our office was a humid and dirty basement in Cambridge. Uh, and then we got another piece upstairs, which didn't have as much humidity. Uh, well, the Easel offices were these glorious Silicon Valley offices with the Aaron chairs and even Herman Miller little uh, signs for your name. I mean, it was a beautiful office. So they were spending a lot of their VC money on that. And we were just very scared. We were, we were uh, penny counters. Um, and in the end, uh, we were able to execute, um, despite our lack of experience, uh, because we were we were essentially not very, uh, we were not used to spending. So we, we, um, so we were careful. And I think that their plan was to do a first round and then a second round. And uh, there was even a discussion of acquisition between Easel and, and, and us, but we felt, and I might still have the note somewhere, but we felt that the difference was that we were being very conservative with the money and this would be a, uh, our cultural clash. And I saw the notes recently, so I must have the notes of that meeting. But um, anyways, they, and they have beautiful boots at conferences and we had this uh, janky little setup that cost three pesos. I remember we had an amazing booth one year built by students at the Boston University or Boston College. And uh, it was essentially made out of uh, straws. Right, so we replicated a jungle at the conference, and it was a fabulous boot, really creative. 
and it cost us nothing. I mean, the, the most expensive thing were the were the the sitting pillows and and the three computers that we brought to the show. I believe. That's awesome. And and Easel have one of those booths that you know we had looked at the price and it's like two hundred thousand dollars for the booth, and we had just been like, what? We can't afford that, right? I think ours was like forty thousand dollars or something. Anyways, the point is, uh, uh, they didn't manage to raise a second round of financing, and I don't know all the details, but uh, I think it had to do in part. I don't. I, I mean, I, you would have to ask them. But essentially, we managed to survive, and also you have to remember that they were about to go raise their second round of financing as the market tanked in two thousand. So the market crash of 2000 or 2001, I can't remember, but the market crash when Microsoft was that was uh, when the jury decided or whatever, when when the antitrust thing went forward uh, and the ruling came out, the market, the dot com boom crashed and uh, they were raising in a very difficult time period. And we managed to raise during that time period. But you have to remember, we had been very conservative with our expenses. So anyways, that's uh, that's why uh, Zimmin survived and Easel didn't from my vantage point. OK, I'm not it's sure. interesting from that from your perspective, the the Microsoft judgment was what kicked off the dot com uh, bust. I, I felt like way, it was, there was a, a, there was a bunch of other. I mean, it's always hard to pinpoint, uh, no pun intended, what bursts the bubble. Um, but that's the way I remember it. I just remember that that's, this came through and the stocks, the, the market kind of tumbled. And then uh, the bad news started to accumulate one after the other. People yeah. started to have uh, problems raising money. All these companies like Cosmo. Remember Cosmo? They used to do the delivery of groceries. No. They would do free delivery. Who ever heard of doing that? <laughs> I would like to get some ice cream. And then some guy in, a, in an orange bag would show up at your place and give you. Okay. No, I don't remember. I, I mean, the, the flagship one that I remember is pets.com. Um, it was the same era, same era. Yeah, no, there yeah. were a bunch of those. So it was, it was a, it was a fascinating time to be alive. And I guess those startups were being funded, and uh, and uh, but there was still not a lot of public documentation as to how. Okay, so you basically made it through there, having raised a fund just before, and and like basically penny pinching until you got through to two thousand. Yeah, we got our Series B from uh, Battery Ventures and Charles River, which was about $15 million. And that gave us a lot of runway. I mean, from a company, I had been very careful with $2 million, $15 million. Okay. To us. So was Zimian pre-acquisition, you were acquired by Novell in 2003. Was Zimian ever cash flow positive? Were you ever making a, like a, a profit? Uh, we, I mean, we were making revenue. I don't know. I don't remember if we, we definitely didn't make, I don't think that we were uh, breaking even, uh, but I don't remember at this point anymore. Okay. We sold the company, we sold the company for about $40 million, uh, maybe 42. I can't remember, honestly. Um, but, you know, the investors made their money back. Uh, we all made money. So we were very happy with the outcome. Uh, I've never, I've, I've never had that much money in my life, right? That was, <laughs> was, I was relatively poor in Mexico. Uh, so this was, you know, unheard of. I, I thought I, I would never have to work a day in my life again. So, and then you got a, a VP job in, in Novell and, and sort of decided to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, um, uh, I had at this point been working on the mono project for about a year. That's right. In. And uh, I love the project and Novell gave me money to raise it, to keep going with the team, to increase the team. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that was incredible. So I kept going with the team and trying to find uses for, for Mono. And it's interesting because for the most part, I saw Mono as a way of improving the Linux desktop experience. Um, and it got mirrored into all kinds of political battles over the years. Yep. And in the end, the place where it succeeded beyond my wildest dreams was in gaming and in mobile, uh, which was not part of the original plan, right? I would have done things very differently if that's what I thought it would be. So we ended up in the mobile space. And I think also that the mobile space is what propelled Unity from being a unknown to the gargantuan company that it is today. Okay. So it's all iOS and Apple that made this happen. 
so I guess you you've touched on um, the fact that you had this long track record in free software, that you mm -hmm. were a, a GNU developer, that you yeah. did have that personal relationship with Richard Stallman and started GNOME. Uh, when you started the Mono project, uh, kind of embracing this kind of uh, patent encumbered .NET platform, at least as it was at the time, um, that really was the first thing I remember where you became a target, uh, where you became a kind of a target for criticism. Yes, well, in, I wasn't in, the, in the free software and open source community. Yeah, it actually came in a few ways, right? Their first initial wave was why pick a technology from Microsoft if they're the sworn enemy? And they, but I think that the, the more fundamental issue was Microsoft built bad software, or it had a reputation of low quality software, like hey, Windows crashes, you know, uh, all that stuff. So the reality is why copy something from a company that had not proven that they could design something good. So I think that's the first wave. Uh, the reality is that that was very well designed. And, uh, and, you know, as we know today, right, bugs happen. So it's very easy to just say, hey, you have bugs. Yes, everything has bugs. <laughs> right. Um, the second line of criticism came certainly from people that thought that there was a risk, right? So really the specter of patents wasn't raised initially, it took a while to be raised. Um, uh, or maybe it was known, but it wasn't really a major topic early on. It became right. a thing later on. And I spent yeah. years debating this and, and the fact that pieces of .NET have been given to a standards body. It was just, a, you know, as tedious and horribly, you know, and grueling, uh, the quagmire of online discussion yeah. uh, it was just brutal. That was, for me, that was one of the kind of inflection points in the GNOME community. Because uh, I remember, you know, when Tomboy and uh, what was the the, right. the desktop uh, intelligent automated search thing that oh, Beagle, Beagle, yeah, Beagle, and we were uh, very proud, right? Those because... projects were were like they were created and they were proposed for inclusion into GNOME, and that was really where I saw the the as you say the specter of of the patent risk being raised, where people said, well, you know. .NET and Mono are fine as long as they're not part of the core platform. But if they become part of GNOME, then we have to ship them, and we don't want to ship yeah. them. So, yeah, and I remember it being a real point of contention between Zimian and then Novell and and Red Hat at the time. Um, that 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 this kind of became the first time that we started to see companies kind of putting putting company interest before kind of platform and, and yes there was an episode that is missing here which is like i said it came the criticism came in waves and i think the largest criticism took place in 2006 and this really what changed the whole dynamic because up until then you know it was a uh, mostly collegial debate among people that had a stake in the platform uh, but in 2006 what happened was that microsoft approached novell and they worked out a license deal where Microsoft was trying to get the world to embrace uh, the fact that they had patents that read on all kinds of technology and open source and nobody was buying it. So they found in Novell that they could uh, have a partner that was willing to do this license deal in such right. a way that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't step over the GPL um, framing, uh, but also that raised doubts for the patents that Linux might or might not infringe. So this was seen as a betrayal by the community, uh, rightly so, right? And, uh, but that changed the conversation completely. So the discussion about the merits of mono and the merits of patents uh, that had been fairly collegial among stakeholders became an open discussion with everybody. Uh, stakeholders and non-stakeholders or stakeholders in other places. So it became a open <laughs> battlefield. So you probably remember what happened after 2006, because that is the one where it got very ugly. Um, and at this point, you know, uh, there were facts and opinions all blended together and there is no black and white, right? There was a, uh, the, there was a level you know, when you talk about patents and license agreements and promises and, you know, I spent years getting Microsoft to issue promise after promise after different promise, at different levels for different pieces. So the challenge really was that it was not a black and white thing. It was a, it was a, it was a risk, you know, it was a, a risk 
uh, spectrum. Yeah. And uh, some people were not comfortable with anything but zero risk, which is impossible. You know, even with current Linux, it was impossible, but, you know, made a lot of people very uneasy. But yes, there was there was a series of things that came in rapid succession, right? I remember uh, OOXML um, and, you know, it's o ODF and OOXML oh, being yeah, in competition. Yeah. That was just yeah. after that. Uh, there was the Microsoft deal with the patent risk. And as you said, that was got, there was a real kind of m melding of, um, there was a, a conflation of ideas between, uh, you know, Zimian, uh, desktop and SUSE being part of that Microsoft deal and the patent risk, and you became, in, in some sense, a, a target and a visible target for that due to your high profile as a developer beforehand. Yes. Um, and my perception, looking in from the outside, was that that soured you a little bit on, on, uh, you know, the open source, the broader open source community like no. the Slashbot crowd. And no, it uh, didn't. It actually didn't sour me. Uh, it's a good observation, but I guess I got my first hands experience with uh, online organization. So I've always considered the internet to be to be an amazing force for creativity and getting people together. And I've always described Linux as the first product of getting empowering people across the world because I was collaborating with guys that were working in a tiny little place, God knows where, and that person thousands of miles away happened to share an interest with me all of the way to Mexico, right? And I didn't find anybody in my circle in Mexico that cared about the same things I cared. It was one guy in, in Estonia, one guy in Finland, one guy in the Czech Republic, one guy in the United States. But the internet brought us together, right? So I've always loved that on the internet. And I always thought it would be a force for good. And, uh, and this was the first time that I saw the internet as a way of getting uh, criticisms and attacks and empowering people. <laughs> Again, the same power that it gave to people for good, it gave it for, you know, for harassment. So I had, it was a very traumatic experience. I always loved open source. I never was discouraged by that, but I, I got my first impression of what organized mobs could do on the internet. And sadly, you know, when uh, Gamergate happened years later, I saw a lot of it in, you know, this, uh, the same kind of abuse that I received at that time. So, you know, I felt very sorry for the people that were being the target harassment. And I would say Gamer Gay was probably a hundred times worse. But when I saw the first little bits, you know, the first little weeks of this, it's like, oh God, this is, this is the, you know, the past the war yeah. all over again. So uh, anyways, I never got sour with the open source community, but I understood that the internet, I mean, at that point I realized that everything that I love about the internet could be turned against the people. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is really the big problem. That's why we're having all these discussions about the impact of Facebook and social media and you know all of the algorithm and all those things. I think they're very important discussions for us to have. And, and sadly, I have firsthand experience uh, in this, despite being a very tiny, you know, uh, a very tiny proportion of the kind of abuse that you see today. I got my 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 own experience. So yeah. yeah, but you've like you have been a visible figure um, for a long time, and 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 I like at that point, it seemed like there was a it was a very much a, a flashlight on you. You know the the, the boycott Novell website yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. that initiative, and and I remember you know Miguel de Catha says that OOXML is a good standard and. And Miguel de Catha is a Mac user, and Miguel de Catha, you know, and and it 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 kept coming. Was was like everything that you said or did publicly became this potential flashpoint. Yeah, did that, did that not become tiring at some point. Uh, at the, well, for for a while it was utterly depressing, but uh, but you know, I I like my so two things. Yes, it was utterly depressing. It was horrible, but I. I had a commitment to my team. I had people employed. So I would say that one thing that I realized years later is that part of what kept me going was that I felt that I had a, um, a duty to the people that I had hired and people that were working for me to keep their jobs or find them jobs, right? So in fact, when years later in 2011, when our company got bought out, 
and they laid off the entire team. I could just have gone and said, hey, listen, let's let's just go get a job. At a, I probably can get a job at Google or whatever at the time, right? It would have been easy. But I felt that responsibility to the team to actually go and start up Xamarin, my second company. So it was really <laughs> kind of this, uh, this feeling that I owed it to them that I went and built this company. It wasn't really a, until two years ago that I that I, I stopped uh, that most of this waste was taken away. So these days I only have two reports, uh, you know, so I don't feel the, I don't feel the duty of having to look at, uh, for people's well-being. So, um, so despite being nasty, um, I've always felt that I had to keep going. Um, and you know, these last years have been refreshing in that <laughs> I, you know, I no longer have hundreds yeah. of people working for it me. It seems like you've, and, and it seems like you've come through it as well in terms of, you know, Microsoft is no longer the big bad enemy that that it was in 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 the two thousands uh, for open source. Um, you know, we've seen Microsoft do a lot of good things in in the open source world in the last decade. And um, but I think that it's very important. I think it's very important for the community to hold companies accountable. So today, Microsoft has a good reputation, but like I've said publicly, um, it. It has a good reputation under the current leadership, but leadership right. changes, market changes, dynamics change. Yeah. And uh, if the community is not there, and even the nasty mob community is not there to hold companies to account, being my company or Microsoft or Apple or Facebook or Google, um, the companies will get away with a lot more than they should. And I think that today there's a number of forces that constraint the unmitigated raw power that capital and influence that these companies have. And one of them is, you know, regulation from the top. And sometimes I dislike the regulation, but you know, this is a force of containment. And from the bottom, you have unionization, uh, which sadly in the tech world is seen as a dirty word. It's seen as like unions are things that the yeah. poor people do. So, but I still feel that there's a value in tech workers to be organized and to have their feelings represented. And then there's the external, right? The external customers and the community. So I think that, you know, the criticisms of the community, as harsh as it can be sometimes, is also one of these forces that can contain the unmitigated and almost unrestrained power of corporations. Anyways. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned Xamarin. Um, so after Novell uh, was acquired by Attachmate, Attachmate, mm -hmm. um, as you said, laid off the entire Mono team, um, and you started Xamarin with with uh, you know Nate again, yeah, Nat, Nat yes. sorry, with Nat um, again. And um, was it easier the second time? Was it harder the second time? Was it different? It was it was a lot easier, but it has to do with two elements. On the first company we were trying to build, I, I think we spent the first year and a half trying to build an open source company and that meant we couldn't charge people or it's very difficult to get people to pay you in the second company we started in a very different vantage point which was mono was open source but our technology for ios and android was not so this made bringing revenue a lot easier so we had i think you know by the end of the first month that we had the product in market about about $200,000 worth of revenue, right? So immediately we could pay people. And in fact, we grew without VC funds for the first year to 75 or so employees, maybe 78. I have a picture somewhere. And this was no VC funds, all paid with our own sales, right? So, uh, you know, pay 78 people. That's that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of money. Uh, a, I can't remember how much. Run rate, yeah, yeah. But it was at, it was roughly at 75 or 78 that we decided we do need to grow because the mobile market is hot. We had a lot of competitors in the space. There were a dozen uh, mobile development companies and, uh, and, and we need marketing, we need more sales, we need support. So this is when we got VC and we got VC just uh, after that. But I mean, we're very proud of, I would say it was a lot easier the second time around, a lot easier. But it was because we had a different business model. Okay. And I'm sorry that the business model was not open source, but it paid for Well, it paid uh, for somewhere it. along the line, you're building on an open source core platform, right? So you, you can yeah. argue yeah. that, you could argue that your um, your core product is not open source, but that 
you are. Yeah, in and you will see me on Twitter often arguing that, you know, I am looking forward for, you know, I support everybody that that is using not exactly open source licenses, but still want to share their code or still want to encourage contributors. I know it's not open source like CodeCrutchDB or this or that, but I believe that for us to have a more just world, right? One where the creators can build software that they can share with the world, but still make money, which is something that we felt to do in the first years of Xamarin, of Zemian, uh, is worthwhile. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't think there's a single answer, but God, I really support people that are trying new licenses and new business approaches and trying to balance both the good that they can give the world and the good that they can do for themselves without having to become monks, right? Or, or a commitment to okay. revenue. Yeah. So do you have an issue with, um, um, like one of the things that, that I have an issue with, with, uh, with things like the server side public license or the business supply licenses is that they are, um, they're not open source, but yeah. that they, uh, the messaging around the projects that are released under those licenses is, all about trying to get the the open source halo that that is kind of trying yeah, to leverage the, the benefits I of think, open source branding yes, i don't think that you should use the open source brand if you don't meet the criteria right um and you'll see a thread just this week in twitter where i made that case to a, a good guy that that you know was was misusing the term uh, and i like him and he changed his mind um i don't think that you should use that halo i think that it's entirely fine to say hey listen i'll share my source you can look at it but i don't want you to sell it not my choice, not my preference, but it's his business and I respect it. And I think that we need more experimentation along those lines. I don't have a good answer to what it is, but I also think is, hey, let's respect the open source brand because we fought for its meaning and we fought for what it is. So, uh, you know, if you want to come up with your, your new name for something different, that's fine. You know, I support, if you want to build a proprietary company these days, I would say I'm a lot more uh, lenient to that, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, people have to pay their bills and feed their family. So whatever is the blend that works for you, I'll support you. But I still think that there's a wide spectrum of experimentation between pure proprietary, pure open, and we can find the right, you know, the, the, the right point in the middle, the right gray, or they're like, you know, this multi-dimensional space of things that you can tweak. It doesn't have to be yeah. black or white. It can be, you know, like orange or bright orange or dark orange, right? So we need to find what that is. And um, anyways, um, yeah, it's a longer topic. I do it have is. to say, It's one I've been exploring quite a, lit, quite a bit. So uh, I, I'd, I'd like, like to just for, for missing our, our meeting today. If you want, I'll be happy to make up the time uh, some other time. I'm, I'm free tomorrow. No, that's, that's good. I, I just wanted to um, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much, Miguel, for your time. Have a good and I'll one. talk to you soon.